question, I suppose, is to Oliver. Oliver Postgate, how did small films come into existence? Uh, mm, yes, well, that, that's a, a difficult question. I took a round by it being called a master class. Like, <laughs> a monster class in the <laughs> art of course animation. Um, small films took a long time to come into existence. It started, and the whole, the whole business started when I was 1957, I was a stage manager at Associated Rediffusion, which became, later became defunct, which was the London television station. And I got, um, I was in the service of a uh, director who was making ch uh, children's programs. And in those days, the children's programs were largely consisted of um, still pictures shown in sequence with a story being told over the top. And it, Jack and Laurie was like that later. And it was just uh, it's a still picture and the story would go on and then after a little while you would get the impression that the picture was no longer relevant to the, where the story had got to and I, I found this a bit um, disappointing really but uh, as, as they explained to me they had something like 100, between 100 and 150 pounds for every 10 minutes show uh, they couldn't afford to have more than one camera going and they couldn't afford to have um, any more pictures, and um, so there's nothing to be done about it. So I then said, uh, maybe I could do, do do something different. So I wrote a story called Alec the Hunt of the Mouse. Can we tell them about the Irish? We? Well, uh, not, without, not without libel. Um, <laughs> the, the, initially, the, uh, my idea was to make a story with stills in which the stills appeared a little bit faster. You didn't just hang about on one one. You, you threw the stills in at the right point. And I went to the head of the department and said, could I, uh, could we do a story like this? And he said, this is, this story was the story of the mouse born to be king. And um, he said, no, this is, this is what is to me, uh, this is suitable for our marvelous new animation system. And I said, well, what is this? He said, well, this, this Irish gentleman who's invented this marvellous thing, a marvellous magnetic system, and... Um, um, called Visim Visimotion. You're going to name it, aren't you? Yes. <laughs> 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 it, 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 it went on for some time, this Visimotion. Yes. But um, the trouble was that it took three animators, three cameras, three mirrors, looking down on the table. Well, let, uh, let me see the first, uh, may we see the first picture? Uh, that is uh, the, uh, very self-explanatory. So you've got a. Uh, the, this has one particular disadvantage, which is that the person working the magnet underneath the mouse cannot see. <laughs> so it has to be done by dead reckoning. And if you happen to approach the magnet, uh, the mouse with the magnet the wrong way round, the mouse will turn upside down <laughs> or, uh, in the picture, and uh, there is nothing you can do about it except turn the right way up, which you, which you can do by turning the magnet. But if you happen to hit it with the wrong polarity immediately underneath, the mouse would lift into the air, turn over on its back and come down again upside down, in which case the only thing you could do was to reach a hand into the picture and turn the mouse over and uh, reconnect it. And fortunately, uh, it was never recorded, so all these dreadful gaffes went out into the atmosphere. And um, so we, uh, uh, I had to find, uh, uh, anyway, before we got to this, I was sent out to find an artist and I uh, came across Peter. We, we, it went on for a long time, actually, because the first story that Oliver wrote about Alexander the Mouse was only six episodes, but they wanted more and more, and it went on for six months doing these weekly um, mouse stories. And I was living in Battersea and, and struggling to make a... Uh, living as a commercial artist, freelance, which didn't really bring in much cash. And uh, this person came to my, our flat in Battersea and said, can you do lots of drawings for very little money? And uh, I said, television? Well, Oliver tells me I was a bit scathing about television. Well, so it, it, was, it was, I mean, it was prostituting your art, wasn't it? Really, yes. He was an actual artist and he didn't want to have to do 30 backgrounds for mice and um, uh, several dozen 
mice as well. Mm -hmm. uh, the thing was that Oliver was also, it was also, the reason he came to me was because he'd be, been given an artist um, whom he could not really get on with. And um, uh, so he came to me as a sort of a last resort. And they said, well, you can have Peter, but Peter will have to have the fee, 30 pounds. And the other chap will have to go away with his forty pounds. So I had to agree to do all this for thirty pounds. Yeah, I'm afraid so. Yes, yes. yes. Well, he did draw the mice with the two eyes on the same side of the head, and one found it rather difficult to animate them in those circumstances. <laughs> and we, it went on and on. We did quite a lot of those films, and in fact, there was so much work that I, uh, living in a, a house in Battersea with students on the upper floors, I got them all working like. Um, uh, you know, to, uh, to, produce, to produce all these backgrounds for me because I couldn't cope with all the work and uh, so it went on. Okay. So well, after we had 26, we had 26 Alexander the Mouses and they were a nightmare and at the end of it we weren't going to do any more. And um, you can take that one away now because we're finished with that. And, um, so what, what were you up to instead? Because you've got, you've got things well, to do. Well, yeah, um, you bought a camera. Uh, you, yeah, well, you? I'll come to that later. Yeah, you say what you did. Well, uh, <laughs> yes, but uh, the, the method of animation did go on a bit. And in fact, I, I, did, I illustrated a series called The Miller and the Magic Trees, which was written by Robert Bolt, the famous Robert Bolt. And um, I think that went on for a, a few more weeks. And um, meanwhile, you were... Um, I did have to, um, I can't work out the time scale. No, the time scale better. is that you were on the musical box. Oh, yeah. well, exactly. Now, um, can, can I did a... Uh, ladies and gentlemen, you get an idea of what we're up against. <laughs> <laughs> We've timed this, uh, this event running a little under six hours at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, we, 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 which is a good thing. Um, but I have at uh, times to pop up and appear to be a bit of a spoils ball, which, which is not my intention, but there is a need to nudge things along. So, musical box, did you mention all that? I did mention yes, yes. Well, actually, um, yeah, well, because this animation system was too expensive, they said we can't afford all these cameras and things. You'll have to do a pro work out a program that we can do for not more than £35 per person and two people running this program. Uh, you know, and it lasts a quarter of an hour. And um, my wife and I, we sat down and thought, and Jeremy said, what about nursery rhymes? And so I worked out this idea of making very, very simple animations of nursery rhymes. And this is one of them. I can just sort of give a sort of rough demonstration of this. Um, the cat. Hey, diddle, diddle, the cat and the fiddle, you see. And he says, hey, diddle, diddle. Hey, diddle, diddle. <laughs> the cow jumped over the <laughs> The, the little dog laughed. <laughs> you got the and the dish, the dish, the dish ran away with the spoon. <laughs> I did one of those every week. Uh, with uh, first of all with Rolf Harris. They found this young Australian who was entertaining at the Anzac Club and they said we've got this young Australian who can play a concertina and he can sing a bit. So he presented the programme and uh, Rolf uh, did about um, six months of this and then he became famous. He went back he to Australia. He tied his kangaroo down and left. That's right. <laughs> so I, I, I got then, uh, they gave me Wally Whiten who was another performer who did, uh, uh, carried on from that time. We did actually eight years at the Musical Box weekly unscripted, <laughs> all rather, you know, sort of thrown together, but it sort of worked for that sort of time. There was no recording, there was no visit video, so it had to be done live. And we went on doing that. Meanwhile... Well, I, I had to find something to do, and um, I had to... Uh, I, I was trying to get away from magnets, and I, I, it seemed to me that uh, these, these ought to be... I ought to be able to do a... Uh, the same sort of th thing on film. So I went along to the head of the department and said, um, I want to make the next series on film. And he said, there's not enough money in the budget. I said, how much money isn't there? And he said, 150 pounds of program. I said, I'll do it for that. And uh, he gave me the job of making a film for the deaf, which was called uh, the journey of Master Ho, and it was a Chinese story, and um, I, um, 
I was very fortunate that it was for the deaf because it didn't have to have a soundtrack. And I managed to find an honorary Chinaman who was prepared to make Chinese, do Chinese pictures for 30 quid a set, which was very fortunate. And uh, uh, show me the next picture. And I, I uh, made uh, the ostrich, which is a, an animation camera, which is made out of G cramps and its old scaffolding. And that was in the bedroom at home. It had a slight disadvantage, which was that uh, in order to shoot a single frame, uh, single frame filming, I should explain, is where, where you shoot one frame after another and then ultimately they become animation, uh, they become movement. Uh, every time you touch the camera, the ostrich would move away and move back again. So the, the effect was uh, that it was uh, extremely, had to be done very delicately. And I think I made some of the worst animation that has ever been seen. <laughs> uh, the, the, um, it's all, it was all about a little Chinese boy and a water buffalo, and I had no idea of the, there was no idea of the length of time, and I had no idea how long I was making the film, uh, because I, didn't, I hadn't grasped that 25 frames would it be a second, so it came out extraordinarily long, and uh, extraordinarily boring, and uh, <laughs> was received with great delight by the company, which uh, surprised me an awful lot. And uh, you then got out of the musical box, so you're in musical box. I carried on with musical box. And yeah. you also got some puppets, and a life Oh, well, puppets. things got very busy then, because Oliver was doing that, I was... Um, uh, in musical box, I had my, made my first ever glove puppet, which was, I thought, how do you make a glove puppet? I got a glove. And I put a head on it and I put arms on it and he was called Billy Whistle. He was a little, so he played a little concertina so Rolf Harris could play the high notes on his accordion and I would do this to introduce the thing. And then they, they said, we need uh, some puppets for um, a new program that uh, uh, has been devised by Howard Williams and Wally White and Ivan Owen. And it's called The Three Scampies. It's about three out of work um, circus performers. And we thought we would like uh, to puppet Tiger Cubs. Now Wally and I had already discussed um, doing some more puppets and we thought of a fox and a hedgehog and um, the, uh, uh, the fox um, became known as Basil Brush, the hed hedgehog was Spike McPike, a little Scottish fighting hedgehog. <laughs> and, um, so I, ma I made this puppet. The strange thing was that when I delivered Basil Brush, because I made the first one in 1963, and when I delivered Basil Brush to the studios at Wembley, Rolf Harris had just arrived back from Australia with his tiny kangaroo down hit. And so it was a strange sort of coincidence that these two things came together. Bring um, oh, this is actually Basil Brush's... <laughs> <laughs> but this is Basil Brush's understudy because the original Basil Brush uh, belongs to the family of Ivan Owen who passed away several years ago but um, they keep the original one. He's, in, he's, he's been going now, I mean, when you think, 63, he, he went on for years and years and years. And I remember once putting my hand inside the original one, it was revolting. <laughs> Talcum powder and uh, grease from his hand over many years. That one was made for um, being photographed and perhaps personal appearances. So now, uh, you may have seen on the television a new version of Basil Brush. It's a new puppet. It's a bit different. But uh, luckily, the originals still survive and some of the old clips still are shown from time to time. So I made him. I mean, I did, had no more to do with that than... You had just, small checks coming down out of the sky, <laughs> like confetti. <laughs> <laughs> he was earning money. They, they, they said, they said we, we can't afford to pay much for this, but we'll pay you £12 to make him, and a pound every time he's used. <laughs> so in effect, he belonged to me. So it was just a hiring thing, so I still owned him. So, you know, gradually as the years went by, and then the BBC took him for the Basil Brush show and for Nixon. And uh, the checks got a bit bigger. So yes, he Basil Brush was very kind to me over the years. <laughs> and I don't know. I don't know who worked with Basil Brush. Was, I was at the drama school with him in 1948, and he was he went out uh, to be an actor in his own right, and he, he wasn't doing terribly well. And I asked him if he would uh, come and be under Fred Barker, which was one of our puppets. Uh, we, had the little, we had it for the dog watch and. He wasn't sure he was going to be able to. But he, uh, once he got a puppet on his hand, he was able to say things which he couldn't 
managed to say when he was in the flesh. And it gave him a new, completely new lease of life. And the characters which he produced at the end of his hand were quite different from the mild-mannered and rather, rather sort of nervous sort of character which he was originally. So it's, it's, very, it's extremely useful to have an alter ego. That's, always, that's why I always try to persuade, um, you know, children with puppets can sometimes um, do things that they can't do themselves. And puppets are a great way of expressing yourself if you are perhaps a bit inhibited or a bit shy. So I think puppetry is a, is a great medium for that. But anyway, we, we had to, um, I, I uh, there found that the... Um, oh. I mean, you can say that there is a picture of, of all of Peter's puppets. Oh, good way. Um, or some of them, anyway. I'm so sorry, you're absolutely right. Billy Whistle is the one on the left. He was the first one I ever made. And then Ollie and Fred were two puppets. I made Ollie and Beak for when Pussycat Willem went on holiday. I had to make a puppet. and. Uh, um, Wally White who worked for that one. Fred Barker was made for Oliver's program, the program we did together called Dog Watch, um, and uh, they became quite well known on a, a program called um, Tuesday Rendezvous with um, uh, various um, presenters. And then I did a program with um, Musket, uh, that's a Koi Pew character, Musket, and a little rabbit called Dido, and that's Basil Brush, and this, <laughs> that one is a puppet I made for Bert Whedon, the famous guitarist. He said, he said, can you make me a puppet that will sing, it wants moving eyes, but it also wants to play a guitar, and the guitar wants moving eyes. So in fact, I did this, and I think it, you, he used it for six times, and then I've never seen it since. So I didn't think it was a very successful puppet. But this, this happens from time to time with puppets. I made a puppet called Whittles, which was, they said, can you make us an otter that can do light crafts? <laughs> I made this rather stiff little puppet, I had to make his hand to hold a brush and he was supposed to sort of do this sort of thing, but it, it, it didn't work. A lot of puppets just don't come off. So, and that was it. Now, the, the obvious question that springs to mind is that at which point did you start working together? Well, we, we got back to working together. It was chaos already, and uh, uh, the, the AR had liked the films and wanted some more. And I had to find them another subject for a film, and we, we had no, um, I had nothing in my head really, but I, I wanted something which would appeal to uh, English audiences, and the things, they're not really ones for cuddly bunnies, I didn't think, and I thought railway engines, I was a, I always wanted to be a railway engine when I was a boy, so I uh, thought of a railway engine, and where were railway engines? Um, Photogenic was obviously Wales because I was infatuated with the work of Dylan Thomas at the time, anyway. And um, uh, but we, so I, I thought I wanted one about the railway engine, but I didn't know what he was going to do. And it suddenly came to me, and you may not wish to believe this, you're very welcome, but it came to me when I was in the bath, and I leapt out of the bath and ran damply to the telephone and rang up Peter and said he wants to sing in the choir. And Peter replied, well, of course he wants to sing in the choir, and the Railway Engine would want to sing in the choir. So uh, I, I uh, had um, I'd already known uh, an engine driver who was very attached to his engine at Denzelwood, and um, I thought there was going to be a story there about the Railway Engine wanting to sing in the choir. So I um, went and got the order for it, and uh, we'll see the next film, shall we?